Yeah, I tell you what, you ladies put up with us guys. I don't know how you do it, but praise God you do. I'm glad. I can honestly say I wouldn't be here without my wife today. I just wouldn't be here. Thank God for faithful wives that are true helpmates. And um, I've seen the other side of that fence, and I've seen it where it didn't work out that well. Thanks be to God. Dorothy and I, after 50 years, we're still together and getting stronger and loving her more. She's loving me more. We're doing more than we've ever done in our life. Uh, we just got back yesterday. I taught at uh, CBC for four hours. We started at nine and went to one straight through. Oh, we took a break. You know, after 50 minutes, you take a break, come back. And then we had a carry-in dinner with everybody. It was great. And then we came home. Um, I've learned in my life, 45 years in the ministry, being saved since 1966, uh, knowing the Lord all my life, met him when I was a little boy, but I surrendered my life in, in uh, January 1st, 1966, I was in boot camp in the Navy. And I still got that Bible that I wrote down, and uh, I was in the induction center in Kansas City, Kansas on my baccalaureate night when I was a senior in high school. I already signed for the Navy. And so while they were having the baccalaureate, I was in Kansas City at the induction center. And this old man came in in a black coat, never said a word, but he gave each one of us a small Gideon Bible. I'll meet this man in heaven and um, I've still got that Bible, and it's on my desk because I took it to boot camp with me, began to read it. In January, I've got it written on the back of my Bible because uh, it has there a decision for Christ. And I wrote in the back of that little Bible, New Testament, January 1, 1966. And... Um, I'm telling you, God is so good. And over all these years, I've, I've gone through, we've all gone through things as God's people. But as we learn to stay in love and faith and trust God, God is faithful to all of his promises. They're all yes and amen in Christ Jesus through us. Dorothy and I, over the years, we've been to the place where we didn't, we was raising our three little girls in one little apartment, and they were all in one room, and we didn't even have dressers, or we had all of our clothes up on the floor, some of them up on the, in the closets, and um, we've watched God faithfully take care of us, and we've never lacked for anything, we've never begged for bread never will. God is faithful. And there were moments in our life where we didn't have a dime, we didn't have nothing, didn't have any food to feed our babies. I mean, we were Mother Hubbard, the cupboards were bare. We didn't tell anybody our need except we said, God, thank you. And just at the last minute, God would come through and supply everything we had need of. I've determined in my life that I would be like Abraham, that I would say that no man would make me rich, but only God. My retirement plan is I'm not going to retirement. I'm not going to retire, but God will supply all my needs. And I can tell you, Dorothy and I are so blessed financially in every way. We owe no man anything except to love him by the grace of God. And... Um, by that, I don't mean we're completely, we're making a house payment. And um, I don't consider that a debt. It's only a debt when I quit paying my house payment. But God is so good. He is so faithful to us. We have been blessed with four wonderful children, grandchildren, two awesome son-in-laws, a daughter-in-law. We have a family that loves God.
because God is faithful. And I've seen so many Christians over the years turn their back on the faithfulness of God because of overwhelming circumstances. Now, I'm going to talk this morning about new revelation of Jesus. And I'm going to use Peter as the example when he walked on water because we miss that so much. So we're going to read this and we're going to look at some elements in here that all of us face as Christians. The outcome of our Christian life is our faith that works through love. Count it all joy when you're going through various trials. Why? Because it's the trying of your faith that is more precious than gold. And I want to tell you what that means. It means faith always wins. Faith has never been defeated. It's undefeated against the enemy. So when all hell seems to be breaking loose in your life against you, you've got to understand it's not you because you've been acquitted. You've been proven innocent through the courts of heaven by the blood of Jesus. You're never on trial, but there's something in you called faith that God put in you so that you could overcome all the works of the devil that's already been destroyed. You can overcome every circumstance in life with your faith if it works through love. So then, whenever, if whatever you're facing now, I, I'm, I hope this, this message will encourage you this morning. Stay in faith. Stay in love. Stay in faith. Stay in love. And if you'll do that with patience, victory is secured for you already. It's just a matter of time before you see it in the physical realm. God is a faithful God. And the whole Christian walk is to have new revelations of Jesus. That's what sanctification is. The Holy Spirit takes the, the Word of God and reveals the living Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Scripture tells us that the more we see Him, the more we become like Him. And so the, it's a constant revelation of Jesus. When I first met Him, I knew Him as my Savior. Then I met Him as the baptizer in the Holy Spirit, the healer, the provider, and progressively and I'm even now getting, I'm getting a new revelation of the Lord in the last few days, actually, that I have, no, I have no earthly way of putting it into words yet. Because I'm always looking to Jesus. Not the body, but the head. If you look at the body of Jesus, you're going to miss the head a whole lot of times. I don't know if you've figured this out yet, but the body doesn't always represent the head. I don't always represent the head right. I'm the body of Christ. So if you get your eyes on a man or a woman, I don't care how perfectly they're trying to walk with the Lord, unless you become like Paul, he says, follow my example. And leaders are supposed to set an example. And I believe that I and the elders of this church and the leaders, that we've set an example for you to follow. But the other side of the coin is if we stop running the race the way we're supposed to, quit following us. I'm not going to miss this thing. Believe me, I fear God too much. The point I'm making is, church, that we have got to keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when you do that, you will have a supernatural love for his body. Because every person in this room is a part of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we as the body are on this earth to build each other up in love. And the manifold grace of God is in the grace given to the individual people in the body, gifts, callings, anointings, to bless one another and build one another up. And 
the grace you need from God could be that brother or sister sitting right beside you. They may have the grace that you need. Or maybe that brother or sister you don't like. They have a grace of God to give you, but if you don't receive it from them, there's a part of the grace of God you're not going to get. Because part of the grace of God, it all comes from the head, but it says it works through the body that it builds itself in love when every part is functioning. So there's grace in each of us for purpose, for blessing, for anointing. And that's why the more I fall in love with Jesus, the more I fall in love with the body, the more I can receive the grace that a brother and sister might bring to me. When I go out and minister a lot, um, um, some of the, the CBC students will come up and, and, and say, can I pray for you? I, I think I have a word for you. Say, Absolutely. Go for it. And I've had some of the young uh, ones in their 20s, man, bring me some of the most awesome word from the Lord I've ever heard from anybody. You know why? Because I receive it from them. If I ever get to the place that I can't receive from the body of Christ, then I'm telling you what, I'm not connected with the head properly. Because if you're dis disconnected from the body, I'm telling you right now, you are not connected to the head. You are by faith. You are by eternity. God will never leave you or forsake you. But if you're not rightly connected to the body of Christ, it's because you're not rightly connected with the head. I don't care how spiritual you think or say you are. The way I know your spirituality is how much do you love me? How much do you have my back? How much do you care for me? How much do you care for your brother and sister? How much do you lay your life down for the body of Christ? How much do you wash the feet of the saints? Because the more you're connected with the head, the more you'll be the head's connection to his body. You're awesome. You are a part of the manifold grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, that is awesome. I want to read about Peter walking on water, starting in uh, Matthew 14, verse 22. And this is right after Jesus fed the multitude and everything. And then he, he said, then he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was many farther distance from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I. Have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And, and beginning, beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, we see some things here. There was a revelation of Jesus that the disciples hadn't seen before. They had been on the stormy sea before, but Jesus was in the boat with them. And he got up and rebuked the storm, and it was, it was still. What's interesting, in the Gospel of John, the same story, it says when Jesus got in the boat, immediately they were on the other side. It's like, bang, there they were. When they saw Jesus walking on the water, because he, now here's the thing. They were under the command of the Lord. They were, they were, 
going to the other side. So they were in obedience to the word of God. And, and, and here's the point I want you to see. When you and I are obedient to the word of God or a rhema word of God, you may run into some storms. But you're in the will of God. Do you think Jesus was surprised that they were out there in the middle of a storm? But they were still under the command. They were obeying his word. They were going to the other side. Mark says Jesus meant to walk by them. And I thought, Lord, why in the world, why, why would you want to walk by him? Well, it's very simple. Jesus said to go to the other side. They were obeying him, so they would have made it to the other side. But they happened to see him. They saw him in a way they had never seen him before. And they said, it's a ghost. And Jesus said, no, it's me. So they, 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 they were in the storm. They were in the will of God. And the storm was beaten against them. Jesus dismissed the crowd. He went to be alone with the Father. You're only going to see Jesus alone in two, two instances. Whenever you see him alone, it's when he went alone to be with the Father. He just shut himself in with the Father. The rest of the time, he was always with his disciples. He was always breaking bread with the lost. He was, he was mixing with humanity. But when he went to the Father, he would go and be alone with the Father. The other time you see Jesus alone was on the cross. He was totally alone then because the Father even said, I've got to turn my back on you. The Holy Spirit had to leave him. He had to become sin, totally alone. Those are the only times you'll ever see Jesus alone. The rest of the time, he's with the body. He's with the lost. He's with humanity, revealing the Father to them. So here he is walking on the water, and Peter sees him. Now, you gotta, I want you to show something. The boat represented Peter's life. He was a fisherman. That was like his traveling office, so to speak, from the time he was a boy. His daddy was a fisherman, had a fishing company, and, and, and he was taught to learn to be a fisherman. So that boat, you know, the, the, that's what kept him afloat from sinking to the bottom of the sea, you know, the, the, just that wood plank underneath him. But that's, the boat was his security on the water. Also, the boat was his lively income. So it represented Peter's life and some of the James and John were fishermen. So what you see is here's these men, the disciples in a boat, which represented security to them. In Peter's case, in James and John, it represented their livelihood. So what you see in this picture is us in our livelihood, things that make us secure, things that we're familiar with. And when Peter and all of them saw the Lord, they didn't recognize him until he revealed himself and said, it is me. It is me. Don't be afraid. It's me. Take heart. Do not fear. And, and when we walk in the Lord, I have discovered that the Lord, uh, by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, the Lord would reveal himself to me in a new way I had never seen him before. For instance, when I went to, to, to being taught about the baptism and the Holy Spirit, that was contrary to the church that I went to's teaching. But I had to believe the Word of God. I had to believe what Jesus said is still true, that he's still baptized in the Holy Spirit. But I had to take my security and change my thinking so that I could see and meet him in a different way, and that is as the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. And when I did that, guess what? 
He didn't let me down. He baptized me in the Holy Spirit. And so then learn to, to see him as my provider. Because you see, we're all raised, whether you realize it or not, money represents your life, your physical life. Just like the Holy Spirit is your spiritual life. So money, when you get born again, you don't realize this, but money is a representation of your life. Everything in the physical, now I'm talking the physical realm, everything you have need of is provided by money. Am I right? I'm right. Come on, agree with me. If you don't have no money to pay your bills, you're not going to live in your house very long or keep your car or, or buy, put food on the table. That's why the love of money is the root of all evil because that means money becomes an idol. But the whole world system is built on a money monetary system because money represents the physical life of man on earth. You buy and trade, exchange countries, you know, exchange commodities. What is it? It's all about money. So, so when I got saved and then really got baptized in the Holy Ghost, Dorothy and I, we began to tithe, and it was Dorothy's idea. Because, see, now we've moved into a different kingdom where money becomes my servant, and I'm not a servant of money. There's a difference. And a lot of the body of Christ are still serving money, not realizing how to let money serve you. My cars, they're, they're nothing but a mechanical servant. The only reason I need a car, because I'm in a physical body, and, and I, I don't walk anymore, I don't, I don't ride a horse no more, I'm in a new mode of transportation. You go back 150 years ago, your, your, your servant was your horse to get you somewhere or a carriage or you know what I'm saying to you. The only reason I need a car is because I have a physical body. And what is it that provides my car? Money. I guarantee you, you go and try and buy a car and say, do you have any money? No, but I got a lot of faith. You're not going to get a car from that dealership. Now, because I have faith, I've bought a car before when I didn't even have an income. Hardly. It was incredible. I bought a house. My salary was 20 bucks a week. So I've seen God supernaturally open doors because I wasn't serving money. Money was serving me. And I learned then that the principle of life and when it concerns money is in my life of giving to the Lord because he is the source of all my supplies. All I have need of, his hand has provided. And I thank the Lord almost every day. You want to know what the will of God is? Rejoice always, pray constantly, and all things give thanks. This is the will of God concerning Christ Jesus, concerning you. So I just go around, I thank the Lord. Now I walk through my house at night sometimes just praying and I thank him for the beautiful home I have. I thank him for the, the mechanical servants. I thank him. And now my first thanking is always about being in heaven and being Jesus forever, the body of Christ. But I'm talking about in the physical realm, I thank him that he's my provider. And I don't serve money. Money serves me. So the first thing I do with money is I take what belongs to God and give it to him. And when people don't understand that principle, I guarantee you, you're struggling financially. I guarantee it. Once you learn that principle, 
I'd rather fast for 30 days and pay my tithe than to eat 30 days and not pay it. I'll tell you right now, my tithe is more important than the food I eat. My tithe is more important than my personal uh, uh, comfort. And I've, God has proved himself faithful to me over all these years, so you, you can't talk me out of it. He has been faithful, 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 because God is a covenant-keeping God. So here's what I'm saying is, here's these men in this boat, and that, that boat represented Peter's life. But now watch what Peter did. When he saw the revelation of this is Jesus, he said, Lord, bid me to come. Here's why. Jesus, listen to what Peter was saying. Jesus, I want to be close to you. I want to know you in this new revelation. I want to be close to you, and I can't get close to you if I stay in this boat. The rest of them stayed in the boat. Yeah, I believe that's the Lord, but I ain't walking out there. I'm going to tell you, church, in order for you and I to grow in Christ, there are times when you're going to have to get out of everything that makes you comfortable to meet him in a new and fresh way, to meet a new revelation of what Jesus uh, is being revealed to you in through faith by the Word of God. Do you have to step out on a new level of the Word of God to meet Jesus at a different level than you're knowing right now? That takes faith. Again, they were obeying Jesus. He said, go to the other side. They were in obedience, okay? And I don't know about you, but you should understand, we all should understand this. How many of you have ran into the storms of life? All of us have. But how did you overcome the storms of life? Just think back, by faith. How many of you have been in those situations and all of a sudden the sea was calm because you stayed in faith? But watch what happened with Peter. He gets a bad rap sometimes, but I'm telling you one, he's the only one that walked on water. And the reason he did, because he did not, he was not saying, oh, wow, Lord Jesus, now I want to be a water walker like you are. Man, then I'll be known as the apostle of the water walker. That's not what he was after. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to say, I can walk on water. He was saying, Jesus, I want to come to you, and I want to get near to you in a new and fresh way. And the only way between this boat and you is the water. And if it's you, the only way I can get to you is walk on the water because I can't swim in this storm. So he stepped out of his life security. Everything he knew about being on the water was about being in a boat. Now, he could swim, of course, but he didn't swim out there with a net on his back and try and catch fish. He'd drown. And he knew in the storm like that, as good a swimmer as these men were, and I'm sure they were very good swimmers, they couldn't survive that storm in the physical so here's Peter saying, Lord, is that you? Yeah, if it is, bid me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter gets out and walks on water. Now, how far that was, I don't know. Maybe it's from here to that wall. Maybe it's, maybe it's way back there. Maybe it's 100 feet, 50 feet. But whatever distance it was, Jesus, when he, command, when he said, come, and here's Peter, he's walking on the word of God now. He was in the Word of God. Now he's walking in a different level of that Word in a, in a situation where he'd never been before. He's walking on water. And he reached Jesus. And I'll show you why. When he began to sink, he instantly cried out, Jesus, help me. Jesus immediately reached out and lifted him up. So he had to be within arm length of the Lord. He had to be that close to him. He had walked that far. 
Now, here's the second thing you got to see about this story, this true story that actually happened, is that when you and I, and I've done this, step out in a new area of faith, and it begins to look like you're not going to make it, you begin to sink, you can do one of two things. You can get into condemnation. Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, Peter could have said, you're right, Lord. I'm in doubt. I'm in doubt, Lord. Oh, my gosh, you're right, Lord. I'm in doubt. Oh, gosh, Lord, I'm in doubt. If he'd have done that, he would have drowned in condemnation. And a lot of times when you step out into a new area of faith, when God's revealing Jesus to you in a greater new way, there may be those moments when you begin to sink or you begin to you know, like, it, Lord, I don't know if this is really working. Or then you begin to condemn yourself. And condemnation will cause you to drown. But what did Peter do? He didn't, he didn't try and do anything except, Jesus, help me. He knew the only one at that level that can help him was Jesus. And Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Now, I don't know how far he sank. It just said he began to sink. When you begin to sink in your new steps of faith, cry out to Jesus real quick. Because you are walking on his word. And Jesus only reminded Peter, Peter, what, don't, why did you doubt? Don't do that. So we see this man, Peter, Stepping out of everything he knew physically, that boat. Also, though, he, him and the other disciples were in the Word of God because Jesus said, go to the other side. So they were not out of the will of God. They were just in a storm. And they'd been in storms before with Jesus. So I, I really believe they had a faith that they, could, they were going to get on the other side, but now the Lord wanted to show them a new way to get there, a greater way than they had even seen before when he himself was in the boat and he stood up and rebuked the storm. And a lot of us have been in those situations. Uh, for instance, the disciples, when that one storm was on them, Jesus was sound asleep. And they, then they said, Lord, don't you care? They woke him up. Don't you care? Don't you see what's happening to us? We're perishing here. How many of us in our faith have gone through that a few times? Now, I know I'm the only one. You're all sitting there like, no, I've never done that. And yes, you have. You've been in those places where you said, Lord, I just, it just doesn't look like it's working. Where are you, Lord? Come on here. And Jesus just looked at him and rebuked the storm. Those are levels of faith. And the Lord carries us to the new levels of faith because, listen, the first time they woke Jesus up like that, they got a new revelation of him. He stood up and rebuked the storm, and it became still. And they were amazed. Man, it's, it's, this must be the, the Christ. Because every experience of faith brings you to a greater revelation of who Jesus is, who brings you into a greater ability to release even more of your faith because you meet him at a level that he's calling you to. And it takes faith to step out of everything you already know to move into that next level. I feel sorry for the Christians who won't get out of the boat. Oh, no, I'm comfortable here. Oh, no, no, I ain't getting out of this boat. Well, you can stay in the boat. You'll probably get to the other side. But there's a better way. There's a new way now. 
The Lord is saying to you, there's a better way now. There's a new way now. And as long as you're locked into your old ways and your own comfort, you're not going to meet Jesus in a new, fresh way. Because it takes faith to step into the new that Jesus is revealing to you through his word and through the spirit where you're getting a greater revelation of who he is. But I'm telling you, you've got to step out of your comfort zone to get on to that new revelation. There's no other way. He's calling you to walk in love. You understand it's the riskiest thing you'll ever do in your life to walk in the love of Christ? Because you're going to get slapped down. Just like Jesus did. But love gives you the supernatural grace and ability to never be offended. Like Jesus. It takes faith to step out into love. Believe me, church. But when you do, you find a new dimension of the Lord you never knew before. You experience more of the love of Christ. So here's Peter again. I've got to go back to this, church. He, he stepped out of, of his security of his job, of his livelihood, of the only thing that kept him safe at, in the ocean, the sea, that boat. And he stepped out into a new situation with the Lord. And the reason was is because when he saw the Lord, he wanted to be with him. And he was. And the good news, watch this. They got, he walked back with Jesus. They got in the boat. And immediately there was a, the storm stopped. Again, the gospel of John says, immediately they were on the other side. That's pretty awesome. Because it speaks of some things. Now watch this. When they got in the boat, listen to these words. And those in the boat worshiped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When you step out in faith, it will cause other people to recognize Jesus as the Son of God. Worshiped him. Truly. I mean, Truly, you are the Son of God. They saw him walking on water. They saw Peter walking on water. They saw Peter walking back on water. And when Peter stepped into the boat with a new revelation of Jesus, all of them worshipped him and said, You are the Son of God. And that new revelation caused the storm to stop. And John's, immediately they were on the other side. Well, what does that speak about? When you get a new revelation of Jesus, it'll stop the storm. There can be a breakthrough that immediately you're there where you were wanting to be because Jesus said, go to the other side. He commanded them to go there. And with that new revelation, they got there that quick where they had been rowing and fighting and trying to get through this thing. I'm telling you, church, every new, fresh revelation of Jesus brings you into a new level of breakthrough in your life, a new level of understanding, a new level of faith, a new dimension of grace and glory. Because every revelation of Jesus is for you to know who he is and that you become more like him, and you can take the faith that he's given you to release others in this world. Is this awesome? I mean, bless Peter's heart. We always, always pick on him and, uh, you know, he's just started sinking. No. That's not the whole story, church. And I really feel like the Lord is telling us that it's a time for you to have new revelations of the Son of God. Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. He has promised in John chapter 14, I think verse 21, he said, if you keep my commandments and love me, 
He said that my father will love you and I will reveal, I will manifest myself to you. And that word manifest means I will make myself real to you. I don't know about you. I'm not going to stay in the boat of comfort, of, of insecurity, of doubt. I'm going to step out when I see Jesus in a new and fresh way, and he's revealing himself to me in a new and fresh way, by the way. And I'm stepping out into that revelation. You say, well, it's easy when the Lord shows himself to you. No, it's not. If it was easy, everybody would have got out of that boat. And when the Lord begins to reveal himself to you in new and fresh ways, I'm telling you something, you might think, oh, wow, I'm going to run to him. Really? Not when it involves some security things in your life that he says you've got to let go of to get this new revelation. Well, give me the revelation, then I'll, I'll let go of these things. No, you won't. You'll try and add him to those things that you don't want to let go of. What he's trying to tell you is, I want you free from everything that's slowing you down spiritually. I want you to learn that there's a greater thing that can happen in your life. You can instantly be on the other side. You can instantly, the storm can stop. You can instantly move into something new and fresh in the Lord because every revelation of Jesus brings a greater manifestation of who he is and changes you and I and to more of what he wants us to be. So I'm going to end with this, just, just encouraging you, church. I believe this is a word from the Lord. I believe the Lord is telling us he wants to give you new and fresh revelations of himself. But it's, you're going to have to step into faith to get there. Well, I, 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 I'm really comfortable where I'm at right now, Lord. And, and the Lord says, okay, you can stay there if you want. Continue to walk in faith the way you are. Continue to fight the storms. Continue to go. You're going to be all right. You will get to the other side, but there's a better way. There's a better way. You've got to step. I want you to hear these words, church. It, faith makes us step out of everything that makes us secure that's not in the Lord. When we resist God and we don't walk in faith, we are putting our security in something here that makes us secure. But in order to top out in the faith, we have to understand he is our security. When the Lord says, you must let go of this, it's letting go of this that will allow us to move into a new revelation of who Jesus is. Am I making sense to you? And that's what happened to Peter. And look at the results. Look at the results. Peter, yes, before the Holy Spirit came, he, he denied the Lord. But listen, look at Peter after the Holy Spirit came. He's the one that says that just when his shadow overshadowed people, they were all being healed. Him and Paul were probably two of the greatest apostles. But I'm telling you what. The molding began back there before the Holy Ghost came of Peter's desire to be near Jesus and to know him and to step out of everything secure. First time Peter, Peter met Jesus, Peter said, Jesus said, come and follow me, and he left everything and followed him. So I want to encourage you today. God is speaking to you. I know right now some of you, God is speaking to you about some new and fresh things. But you're going to have to step into that by faith because I guarantee you your struggle is, is in the securities or the, where you're at right now or the degree that you know him right now. It's going to take faith to step out and to trust him in a new and fresh way. Am I talking to anybody? Because God has new and fresh things he wants us to do. He wants the storm to stop. He wants you to be there instantly because he has a great work that he can do through all of us. Amen? Amen. 
Well, Father, we come before you. Thank you for this good word. Holy Spirit, only you, stirring the hearts of everyone in this room to see Jesus in a new and fresh way. Everyone in this room has the faith. We have all have a measure of faith, Lord. Everybody in this room has the faith to step out into something new. But they have to let go of their comfort or their security or what they already know. God forbid that anybody in this room would think that there's nothing more to know about Jesus. Have mercy on them, Lord. They don't know you at all. But even now, Holy Spirit, as you're stirring everybody in this room, because there's a great day of revival upon us, I pray that their faith will not fail, but their faith will be strong, and they'll step out into the new revelation of Jesus to have a greater dimension of your presence and glory in their life to benefit others, Lord. That others might say, truly, Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. It's all about you being glorified, Father, in your Son. I just release that over your people now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want you to understand something. You are going to get a fresh stirring of the Lord now. And it's going to be up to you whether you'll step into that new revelation. Amen? Amen. All right. Jeff, praise God, a miracle working.